Hello Accounting Boffins, you are with Ashraf Patel and in today's lesson we're focusing on a question, an actual question on cash budgets. So keep your eyes open, keep your ears ready to receive the information so you know exactly how to go about answering a question on the cash budget. Here goes. Let's recap before we go into the question. When we're dealing with cash budgets, we're dealing with receipts and payments. Okay, so for today's lesson, the focus is on cash budgets. The information we have here is that you are provided with incomplete, uh, with an incomplete cash budget of Zoom traders for the period 1st July to the 31st of August. So it's two months you're preparing a cash budget for. And what else do we know? We are told that these are my sales figures and these are my cost of sales figures, obviously for the period July to August. The question arises, why have they given us May, May, June, July, August? Obviously, that will become evident when we actually do the question to see how this information will impact on my budget periods of July and August. Okay, the first question says, it's an appetizer, it's a starter for you, and it says here, provide one reason why it is essential for a business to prepare a cash budget. Okay, one reason why it is essential for a business to prepare a cash budget. Let's look at it. One, to project or assess future cash flows, inflows and outflows of cash, right? Or you could say to predict cash flows to determine receipts and payments for the future. Or you could answer, you could answer by saying to control the cash to calculate the bank balance. Notice, nowhere in your responses has any mention been made about incomes or expenses? Why? The question was cash budget. And that's the important component that you have to take into consideration when you're answering a question relating to the cash budget. Okay. Now we go on and says, it says here required, calculate the credit sales for July 2020. One and then complete the data's collection schedule for August 2020. Right, let's look at the information that we have here. This is your sales figure, but it is your total sales figures. Can you see that? And if you look at the answer book that you have been provided with, you will notice here that they, they've given you the credit sales. So, very, very important. Whenever you are asked to complete a debtor's collection schedule, the emphasis or what, what, is, what, what you require to be able to complete a debtor's collection schedule is definitely your credit sales. Do you see that? So now, now that you have the credit sales, they asked you to calculate the credit sales for July. Let's go back and see the information that we have here. We are told that this, these sales figures are your total sales figures, right? But that's inadequate. That's not what we require to complete the debtors collection schedule. In order to do a debtors collection schedule, like I mentioned earlier, you require your credit sales. And therefore, step number one, calculate your credit sales for July. That's the figure that we have. 108,000 is my total sales figure. I therefore take the 108,000 and I'm told that 60% of total sales are for cash immediately telling you that if 60% was cash, then definitely 40% had to be on credit. So therefore, immediately I say, fine, let's do this here. Take the 108,000, 108,000, right? Which was my total sales for July. 
multiply that by 40% because clearly the figure that's given to me is my total sales and my credit sales amount to 40% of that figure. Therefore, if I calculate this, it gives me a figure of 43,200. I can now go in here and slot in my 43,200. Okay, got it. So there we go. I have now completed the credit sales component for July. Now what do I require? Now I'm told that I must complete the debtors collection schedule in terms of the arrangement with our debtors. What arrangement do we have with our debtors? Let's see what arrangement we have with our debtors. There we go. As you can see in this slide here, we now have slotted in our credit sale of 43,200. Okay. Credit sales are collected as follows. 20% will be collected in the month of sale, right? 70% will be collected in the first month following the month of sale. 8% will be collected in the second month following the month of sale, okay? The balance is written off in the third month in the following the month of sale. Just to give you an idea, what are we referring to here? Obviously, 70 plus 20 is 90 plus 8 is 98%. So you're expecting 98% of your debtors to settle their debts in terms of the arrangement. What's the arrangement? 20% in the month of sale, 70% in the month following the month of sale, 8% will be collected in the second month after the month of sale, and then the balance which you can clearly see here is the 2% will obviously be the bad debt that you write off in the third month after the month of sale. Okay, now that we have that information, we can move on and start doing our calculations. Let's look at May 1st. This is the month of May, right? What do we know? 20% will pay us in May, right? As per our agreement. 70% will pay us in June, right? 8% will pay us in July. Therefore, notice that May's credit sale has no impact on August. The question that you may be asking is why is the 2% not shown in August? Because clearly the 2% is your bad debt that you had written off in the month of August. And we know now, at this stage already, from all the lessons that we have done, that bad debts does not appear in my cash budget. Why? It is a non-cash item, will not appear in my cash budget. However, it will appear in my projected income statement under my operating expense, bad debts. Okay, so there we sorted May out. May is done and dusted. Let's go to June. June, we know that our credit sale is 49200 We know that some debtors will pay us in June, some will pay us in July, and 8% will pay us now in the month that we are dealing with, which is August. Let's do our calculation. We've got 43200 Sorry, we're looking with 49,200, wrong thing I'm working with. Let me cancel that. We're looking with the, at the 49,200, right? Times the 8%. Here we go, times the 8%, and that will give me a figure of 3936. Here we are. There's my 3936, can you see? Although the sale took place in June, its impact will be felt in August because that is our arrangement with our debtors. Once again, a repeat of the arrangements, 20% in the month of sale, 70% the month following the month of sale, 8% in the second month following the month of sale, and the bad debt in the third month following the month of sale. So let's go now to July which we calculated to be 43,200. Again, the question is, how 
will we calculate July? Because remember, all that we require is we are working with the August component of the cash budget, right? So therefore, taking July into consideration, some will pay you in July, the 20%. The 70% will pay you in, uh, in August. So we can do that calculation now. Let's take the 43,200. 43,200 times your 70%. And that will give you a figure of 30,240. Here we go. Clearly you can see July 30,240. And that is now your calculation with regards to the July component. Okay, now... You can see from these calculations that it is important for you to determine how the payments will take place for you to be able to apportion that component in the month that you are dealing with. So these are the months that we are dealing with and, you, and the reason we gave you the May figure to show you that May would have worked itself out and would not impact in August in any way. So we've dealt with May We've dealt with June, we've dealt with July. Now we come to August. August, my credit sale was 33,600. So immediately I go back to my provisos. What was it? 20% in the month of sale. Therefore, let's take our 33,600. 33,600 times the month in the month of sale is 20%. Therefore, looking at my calculation, 6,720. And here we go, August, the, it will impact in August, and the amount is 6,720. So, what is important for you to remember? When you are doing these calculations, make sure that you know how each month will impact on the budget month, and that is important. Once again, watch, I'm redoing this because of its importance. May, we said they will pay us in June, sorry, they'll pay us in May, June, and July, and you can see it works itself out. June will pay us in June, they'll pay us in July, and a component will be paid in August. July will pay you in July, some part will pay you in August. And obviously, you can see here that some part of your July component will also pay you in September. However, September is out of my budget period because my budget period is focused on the month of August. Clear, guys? Okay. Then, obviously, you come to August. And August, they will pay you 20% will pay you in August, which we've calculated to be 6700 20. So in this way, you've now done two things. One, you calculated the credit sale for July. Let's go back and see that one there. Again, that was calculated by means of looking at what your total sales figure, right? Your total sales figure, which you then took 40% of it to determine your credit sale. That was the first part of the question, which we completed, the 43,200. Once this was completed, that means you had all your credit sales that you required. You could then go on and complete your debtors collection schedule, which we have successfully done. All that we do now is we take our figures here, right? And what do we have? Let's take our components. It's a 3936, which was for the month of June, plus your 30,240, which for the month of July, plus your 6,720 for the month of August. And that gave you a figure of 40,896. As you can see, there's your 40,896. Now remember, this 40,896 will fit into your cash budget, right? It will, it will be a component of your cash budget where you will say receipts from debtors. 
And that will then give you the figure that you require of 40,896 Rand. So guys, clearly you can see how important it is to be able to complete a debtors collection schedule. Summarize, important points to remember. Step number one, you need your credit sales. Once you've ascertained your credit sales, you can now go ahead looking at the provisos. In this case, 20% in the month of sale, 70% in the month following the month of sale, 8% in the third month, and then the bare debt. Using that provisos, you then complete the collection of your debtors collection schedule. And like I said earlier on, that figure of 40,896 will appear in your cash budget proper as your receipts from debtors. Right? Let's take a quick break and we'll see you in a jiffy. Welcome back, Accounting Boffins. Yes, remember, we're doing a question on the cash budgets. Quick recap, when you're doing a cash budget, important to remember that you're dealing with receipts and payments because if you were doing a projected income statement, then obviously the, the dynamics will be totally different and you'll focus on incomes and expenses. Right, the question now says here, study the information given and find the missing values so what are we looking for? The missing value here is your cash purchase of trading stock for the month of August. All right. Okay. Let's look at how we're going to go and do this. Let's look at the information first. One, the business uses a markup of 50% on cost. Important in terms of our calculations. Remember, cost price, markup, and selling. Cost is 100 Markup is 50 in this instance, therefore my selling is 150. Okay, so I've got that information. The business maintains a fixed base stock by replacing stock on a monthly basis. Fixed base stock, I've explained it early on. Let me explain it again. Fixed base stock means that you maintain the same level of stock continuously. So whatever stock is leaving your business, that's the amount of stock that you need to replenish. That's the amount of stock that you need to buy in order to maintain fixed base stock. Right. 75% of the total purchases are on credit. Again, information important. 75% of your purchases are on credit. That means 25% of your purchases will be for cash. Creditors are paid in the month following the month of purchase to take advantage of a 5% discount. Okay, so we have all that information. We are now expected to calculate this figure here, which is our cash purchases of trading stock. Let's go back. Right? Clearly you can see that you have your sales figure there. Right? And you need your Cost of sales figure, here we go. Obviously, firstly, we find out that we have 84,000 Rand as the total purchases, right? Determine the cost of sales first. So obviously, this figure of 84,000 Rand will be based on your, let's identify it, there's it, it's your sales figure, right? So it's your sales figure that you are working with. What do you do with that sales figure? You say 84,000 Rand, determine the cost of sale. How do we do that? Times 100. Let's do the calculation together so you can see it. Once again, cost price, markup, selling. Right? Your cost is 100. Your markup is 50. Your selling is therefore 150. So what do we do? It's 84,000 which is my selling price here, times 100 over, so in order to determine your cost price, it's 100 over 150 times your actual selling price. Okay, now 100, so multiply by 100, there's my 100, divide by 150, 
as you can see, there's my 150 times. Obviously, you are told that only 25% will be paid for in cash. The importance of this information is we can see here, 75% of your purchases is on credit. So obviously, your cash purchases is only 25% of the total purchases figure. Therefore, looking at my calculation once again, it's your 84,000 times 100 divided by 150 times your 25%. And that is important. So what are you determining here? Your cash purchase of trading stock. That means how much stock are you buying for cash? So let's take this one step back. Number one, take your sales figure for August, which we did. 84,000, right? Number two, determine the cost of sale, which we did 100 times and 100 over 150 or 100 divided by 150. And number three, the third component, what component of that figure will be for cash? 25%. Can you see? So, very important, guys. Sales, cost of sales, split up into cash and credit. In this case, the question was the cash purchases, and clearly you can see it is the 14,000 Rand, and therefore here, in your cash purchases for August, there's my answer, 14,000 Rand. So once again, it is your sales figure, determine your cost of sales, because obviously it's a cost price of the goods that we're going to repurchase, times the cash component, which was the 25%, to give me a final figure of 14,000 Rand. So clearly you can see there is your cash purchase of trading stock, which was the 25%, namely 14,000 Rand. Okay. You are asked to determine the payment to your creditors. And what, what do we do here once again? Let's go back and see what we're going to do here. Number one, same story, 50% markup, fixed base stock, 75% of total purchase on credit. Creditors are paid in the month following the month of purchase to take advantage of a 5% discount. Okay, so now, what do we do? Determine the 82,000. What was the 82,000? You can clearly see here that the 82,000 if you purchased in June, you're going to pay that first payment in July. And that's why the question said, find the payment to creditors in July. So you, in this case here, you have the cost of sales figure, right? You have the cost of sales figure. And that's important. 82,000 is your cost of sales. Okay, let's take the cost of sales that we have here. There's my 82,000, right? times 75%. Why? We've got 82,000 times 75%. Why 75%? Obviously, that figure is the credit purchases. You see, you've got your cost of sales. Now you split it up into cash and credit. So you wanted the credit component of the payment. That means, again, Remember, look at the provisos. 75% of the total purchases are on credit. It's your credit purchases that will give you your payment to your creditors. So therefore, we took our figure of 82,000 Rand, which we calculated, times the 75%, and we worked it out to be 61,500. Okay? 61,500. Here we go, Six, that's just a part of the calculation. That's a component of that calculation. I'm just showing it to illustrate to you how you got that 61,500. It was your 82,000 times the 75%. Okay, now, how are you expected to make your payment to your creditors in the month, following the month of purchases, subjected to a 5% discount? The easiest way to do that is to take the 61,500, watch, times 95% and you get a figure of 58425. 
There's my answer. There's my answer, 58425. So once again, watch what I did. I took my cost of sales component, the 82,000, because that's the amount of goods that I have to buy. I split it up into cash and credit. For this particular calculation, I needed my credit component. Therefore, that was 75%. So I calculated that to be 61,500, and then I'm told that I'm only going to pay 95%. Why am I only going to pay 95%? Because I'm entitled to a 5% discount. Therefore, you could first calculate the 5% and subtract it, but you don't want to waste time with that. Go directly to your answer. Take your 61,500 times the 95% because we're only going to pay the creditor 95%. The 5% is my discount. Therefore, I'm going to pay an amount of 58425 as my payment to my creditor. Okay, done and dusted. Let's move on. We are told that salaries, the workers will receive an increase of 3% in August, right? The bookkeeper will also receive an increase in August 2020. Right, there's your salaries of your five workers, 32,000 Rand, right? Again, based on the information that we have, firstly, you said they wanted to know, the question said, uh, calculate the, the, uh, the, the amount that has to be paid to our salaries of our workers. So there's my 32,000 of all five workers, right? Immediately, you can see that there's an increase for those workers. And how do we take that? We say, look at the amount they, they receive an increase of 3%, right? And if we take that figure, uh, let's get our calculators out. Let's take that figure times by 3% will give me a figure of 960. And I now say that the, the workers will receive an increase of 3% in August. Therefore, will, the bookkeeper will also receive an increase in August. Therefore, watch what we do here. The 960 is the increase, as you saw on our calculation. There's my 960. So therefore, the new salary will be the 2,000 plus the increase will give you a figure of 32,960. Here we go. 32,960 will be the new figure. And therefore, here you can see that that was my old salary. Increase it by the amount of 3%, therefore giving you an increased figure of 32,960. Okay, next one. The insurance premium is paid at the end of each month. Right, the monthly premium will increase by 10% on the 1st of August. Okay, interesting question. Look what they've done. They've told you what the August premium is. Now remember, the insurance premium is paid at the end of each month. However, the monthly premium will increase by 10% on the 1st of August. So this figure here that you're seeing, the 2904, includes the 10%. So it has the new premium built into it already. The question wants you to calculate the previous month's premium. Can you see that? So a totally different angle to this question here. You are expected to calculate the premium prior to the increase. Okay, this is what we do. Watch what we do. You take the figure of 2904, which was the new insurance figure, right? And you say, fine, take that figure, multiply it by 100, divide by 110. Why are we doing that? Very simple. It means the, increase, the old insurance was 100, and the new insurance is 110. Clearly, you can see that the figure that you are working with, the 2904, the 2904 is the figure which has the increase built into it already, namely the 110. Let's do this calculation here. If we take our 2904, 
2904 times 100 divided by 110, and that will give you 2640. So clearly, what was the 2640? Your 2640 was the increase, was the amount of the insurance prior to the increase. So clearly you can see here that the insurance amount prior to the increase was 2640. So clearly 2640, right, was the amount before the increase. Take the increase into consideration and you will see therefore that if you increase that amount by 10%, you're going to get your new figure of 2904 which was given. So in this particular example, they gave you the insurance after the increase. And that's the important part to remember. The 2904 was the amount prior to the increase. In other words, another way of setting this out for you, 2904 is equal to 110%. Watch, I'm showing you another way of calculating this figure. The 100% is your unknown. Therefore, in your calculation, watch, we cross multiplying. 2904 times 100 divided by 110. Clearly evident from your calculation. 2904 times 100 divided by 110 will give you 2640. Okay, so that's how we calculated the, the insurance premium prior to the increase. Here we go. This is our final figure. 2640 was my answer based on the 2904. So in terms of percentages, this was your 110% and this was your 100%. As you can see, it increased by 10%. Okay, so that's how you go about doing a calculation where they give you the increased amount and you have to work out the amount prior to the increase. Okay, guys, so in this particular segment, we focused on specific calculations on how to complete the cash budget based on information that is provided to you. Okay, let's take a quick break. When you come back, we'll go into the final segment of the question on cash budgets. See you just now. Welcome back, accounting boffins. Right, we're busy with a question on the cash budgets. Once again, quick reminder, when you're dealing with a cash budget, remember we said you're talking cash, therefore receipts and payments. Okay, let's look at the question. The workers are dissatisfied with the increase that they will be receiving in August 2020. They've indicated that they will embark on strike action in October 2020 if the owner does not address their concerns. What is their concern? Let's look at the concern again. Remember the salary of the workers, we've already calculated it in a previous component of the question where we found that their new salary was 32,960, which was an increase of 3%. All right. However, the bookkeeper also received an increase and you can see, look at the bookkeeper, he now, his previous salary was 18,000 and is now 19,800. Okay, clearly you can see that that is also an increase and what is important is the following. Give one reason with figures why the workers are dissatisfied one, give one reason with figures that the owner could use to justify the increases that he's going to give the workers. So, this is the type of interpretation of the cash budget, which you should be exposed to, which is important because this is also a possible examination question. So, answer. The workers, why will they be dissatisfied? One, 
they will be receiving a 3% increase, while the bookkeeper will be receiving a 10% increase. How did we get that? Let's go back and check this out here. Can you see? The bookkeeper, if you take 10% of 18,000, will be 1,800. Add the 1,800 there will give you a figure of 19,800. So clearly you can see that they are receiving a 3% increase. That's your workers. Whereas this bookkeeper is receiving a 10% increase. Clearly a disparity. Okay. Then, the 3% that they are, uh, the increase that they are receiving is lower than the inflation rate, which currently is maybe at 6%. Obviously, this figure here, this 6% is going to be a variable, meaning depending on the economy at that time. So obviously, when this question was drawn up, the inflation rate at that time was 6%, as opposed to the increase of 3%. So surely the workers would be dissatisfied because they are receiving an increase less than the inflation rate. However, if the inflation rate was 1%, then clearly this would not be valid. Why? Because they are receiving an increase of 3%, whereas the inflation rate is 1%, they are clearly receiving an increase above the inflation rate. So therefore, what I'm saying is the inflation rate is something that is a variable, meaning it will change. It changes whenever the inflation rate is worked out in the, in the economy. So obviously, that will be a variable, meaning changing with circumstances. Right. Then... Give one reason with figures that the owner could use to justify the increases that he's giving to his workers. One, the business is experiencing cash flow problems as the bank balance is expected to be overdrawn at the end of August by 120,000. Obviously, based on the information that is provided to you, in this case here, because the cash flow is showing an overdraft of 120,000, it clearly indicates that the business cannot afford to give bigger increases. And as a result, they are limited to the increase, which already will result in an overdraft in the bank of 120,000 Rand. Okay, again, look at the information that is provided in the question. Two, your total sales figure for June 89,100 is below the budgeted amount of 123,000. And he expects this trend to continue. Now, if your budgeted sales figure is less than your actual, clearly indicate, it clearly gives you an indication. And the fact that it is, this trend is expected to continue tells you that the sales are on a decline. Obviously, if your sales are on a decline, your cash flow will be on a decline because obviously you have less sales. This will be a justification for the owner to say, sorry, gentlemen, I can't give you a bigger increase because one, firstly, my, our bank account is in overdraft and there's a clear indication that the sales figures, based on the trend, it, they are decreasing, obviously, and we're expecting this trend to continue. Here yeah, you can see, based on the, this information here now, we have the sales figure, we have the cost of sales figure, we have the gross profit, we have the delivery cost, and we have the advertising cost. These were your budgeted figures, these are your actual figures. Okay. The owner decided to offer trade discounts to, to special customers in July 2020. In your opinion, has this benefited the business? Provide figures to support your answer. What is important, uh, accounting boffins out there? Whenever the question says provide figures, then you have to substantiate your answer with figures from the question. That is important because you will notice 
If you look at marking guidelines, you will see wherever they say provide figures, it indicates to you that marks will be allocated to those figures as well. Okay, so now let's compare. No, actual sales were 84,000 compared to the budget of 108,000. Let's look at it. There's my actual sales figure, 84,000 rand. I budgeted at 108,000 rand. So clearly, this particular idea of giving special discounts or trade discounts to special customers has resulted in my actual sales not being equal to my budgeted amount as a result of which, as a result of which, clearly you can see that your profit that you budgeted for was 36,000 but you only achieved an actual gross profit of 24,000 rand. So definitely, your answer here is no. The actual sales were 84,000 rand compared to the budgeted figure of 108,000 rand, clearly telling you here that it is not um, benefited the business. It actually, it, it caused us if we look at the, the, if we compare the two figures, we've actually lost out. And I've shown you, when you compare the actual profit figure as well, you can see that your gross profit has, you've not achieved your targeted gross profit of 36,000. Rather, you only realized a profit of 24,000 rand. Okay. Explain what you would say to the owner about the control of delivery costs. Right? Quote figures to support your answer and provide one point of advice in each case. Right, let's start with the delivery cost. What do we know? Firstly, let's look at the delivery cost figures that we have here. We budgeted a delivery cost of 10,800. All right? That was a budgeted amount. And the actual amount was 12,000. 600. So clearly, you overspent the budget. You have what we call a negative variance, meaning you spent more than you budgeted for. Okay. Let's look at our responses here. With regards to the delivery cost, our sales were less than the budget. Okay. Let's check that out. Our sales definitely were less than the budget, as you can clearly see. You budgeted 108,000, you actually had sales of 84,000, meaning that your sales were less than your budget. Number two, so your actual delivery expenses should decrease. Why? Because your delivery expenses is directly proportionate to your sales. The more you sell, obviously, the more you sell, the higher your delivery expenses. But in this case here, your sales decreased. So definitely, your delivery expenses had to decrease as well. Okay? And you can see the reason why. Because less sales would mean less delivery expenses. What advice would we give? One, investigate the possible fraud or inefficiency. Right? There's a possibility that fraud is taking place or we're being inefficient in planning our deliveries. Two, change the delivery firm. If you're using a particular firm to do your deliveries, definitely you can see that they need to be changed or we need to investigate with them why is it that our delivery expenses are increasing when our sales are decreasing? Also, maybe start charging your customers for the deliveries, right? Obviously, it means that if the business cannot sustain the delivery expenses, then it may be possible or one of the possibilities that we could look at for future is to charge our customers for del del deliveries outside and maybe have a free uh, range, meaning 0 to 15 kilometers will be a free delivery 
outside of 15 kilometers, then you can start having a pro rata scale based on the distance in order to charge your customers for the particular goods that are being delivered to them. Okay, once again, we look at our sales figures, cost of sales, our gross profit, our delivery we've dealt with, we're now looking at advertising costs, okay? Because that's the next part of the question. We budgeted 18,000, but we spent 23,000. Again, advertising. The owner has overspent the budget by 5,000 Rand. How do we get the 5,000 Rand? By comparing, watch, we compare. Our actual amount was 23,000 minus your 18,000 will give you a figure of 5,000 Rand. Clearly you can see that we've overspent the budget by 5,000 Rand. However, although we spent more on advertising, what impact did it have on my sales? Remember, there's a direct link between your advertising and your sales. The idea of ad advertising is to increase and maximize your sales. Clearly you can see this did not lead to an increase in sales. Clearly evident. You budgeted 108,000, you only had actual sales of 84,000 Rand. Meaning therefore, investigate why the advertising was ineffective. Okay, clearly your advertising was ineffective, so you need to investigate it. So can you see, once again, the interpretation of your cash budget is of utmost importance because it gives you important information which you can then use to make decisions. Clearly, investigate why your advertising was ineffective. Number two, improve your method of advertising. Look at your target market. Who are you targeting? Is your advertising appropriate for that target market? So clearly, in terms of the person responsible for your advertising campaign, right? Or the advertising company that does your advertising for you, this definitely needs an intense investigation to determine why are we spending more on advertising, we're overspending our budget, which is what we call a negative variance. And even though we have a negative variance, clearly you can see it did not improve my sales. So on the contrary, if you had overspent your budget, but it resulted in a substantial increase in your sales, then you can justify overspending your budget. But clearly in this case here, this cannot be the case because although you overspent your budget, it it resulted in a decrease of your sales. Okay, guys, that's the end of today's lesson. You can clearly see we focused on an actual question and you were exposed to different components of a question on the cash budgets. So what do you do? The best way to prepare is to do as many activities, questions, on cash budgets, expose yourselves to the various types of questions that can be posed. And once you do that, I promise you, you will ace the exam. This section on, on cash budgets, you would ace it in the exams. You thoroughly understand it. And remember one more thing, practice makes perfect. And what, critical to all of this is once you love the subject and you have passion for the subject, I can guarantee you, immediately you will see a definite increase in your results. So what you budgeted for for your results, the actual will be much higher because of the effort that you have put in. Until the next time, from me, Ashraf Patel, and the crew, keep your feet on the ground and be good. Goodbye.